generational transfer. Uh, there's a great story in the Bible, in the Old Testament, about um, David's son, Absalom. And uh, let, me, uh, let, me, let me get it up. In 2 Samuel chapter 18, verse 18, this is what it says. Now, um, during his lifetime... Absalom had taken a pillar and erected it in the king's valley as a monument to himself, for he thought, I have no son to carry on the memory of my name. He named the pillar after himself, and it is called Absalom's monument to this day. Okay? That's there in the scripture. This is a, this is a, 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 a moment spoken after the death of Absalom. Okay? And uh, please note it, that it says that during his lifetime, Absalom had taken a pillar and erected it to King Valley as a monument to himself, for he thought, I have no son to carry on the memory of my name. However, I don't know if you know this, but in 2 Samuel chapter 14, verse 27, the Bible says, three sons and a daughter were born to Absalom. Now, if you know the life of Absalom, you will know that the dominating force in Absalom's life at the end of his life was what? Lust. He took on his father, David. He he rebelled against his father, David, because he actually honestly thought David had it wrong. Okay? His motives appear to be okay, but the motivating force was wrong. Now, you see, what had happened for poor old Absalom, this is my feeling, is that he had got to the point where his his life had become so saturated with him and his agenda that, you know, there's a sense that at the end of the day, he he is thinking to himself, unless I build something in my life that reminds people of me, then I will have nothing to leave. But actually... uh, the reality is, is that, is that he had sons. Nowhere in the scriptures can I find that the sons died before Absalom died. So I'm still of the belief that when dad dies, they're alive. But he has lived life in such a way that there is nothing of inheritance for his boys. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't think Absalom's alone in this. Because as I read that, I think, man, alive. I, I see that going on in society today. People who are living, and they're living thinking, I've got to build a monument for myself. I've got to build something for myself. And meanwhile, they have got walking alongside them people that could take things to another generation, but they don't see it because they're living so selfishly for themselves. There is another, there's another story in the Old Testament and it's the story of Hezekiah. And Hezekiah has, has made some wrong choices and he has step, overstepped the mark. And a prophet comes in to talk to Hezekiah about it. And this is what we read. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord. The time will surely come when everything in your palace and all that your predecessors have stored up until this day will be carried off to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord. And some of your descendants, your own flesh and blood, who will be born to you will be taken away and they will become eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. The word of the Lord you have spoken is good, Hezekiah replied. Gee, I don't know how he could ever say that, but anyway, he did. And then he said, for he thought, will there be no peace and security in my lifetime? What had he heard? He had heard the Isaiah saying that after he was dead... Uh, these things were going to happen. And Hezekiah's response was, this is a good word. No, it's it's a terrible word. It's 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 a terrible word for his kids. It's a terrible word for the people to whom he has ruled. But he says this, he says, this is good, why? Because he thought, there will there not be peace and security in my lifetime. Now, I want to say to you, this is the temptation. It's in the Bible. It's the temptation for God's people. The temptation is, is that we will, live, we will live life just worried about our generation, about me, in my time. 
You know, as I get older, I'm, I'm thinking a little bit about this, you know, because, you know, I'm, you know, I've still got a few years to go before I retire, but I... ...in the world, you know, to which I'm ministering to, as a leader, that, oh, honestly, uh, oh, maybe I don't need to worry about because... You know, where I see this is going, it'll actually be the kids' generation that'll actually feel it. But I won't be around. Now, I'm saying to you, it's a temptation. It's not something that I'm yielding to. I'm suggesting that possibly the Bible would be very clear to us that shows us that this actually happens. Hezekiah could live in such a way that he knew that there were things that today needed to be resolved and needed to be sorted. But he was saying... Nah, I don't need to do this because in my time it's going to be okay. You know, I think, I think uh, you know, within our movement it would be very easy possibly to be on a Salvation Army officer and see stuff, for instance, and know, well, I, could, I can live with this, it's not too bad, but you know that there are consequences into the future. And we could just say no. And I think there's something that needs to be said to us about generational transfer. Um, nearly every generation, I don't know if you know this, but nearly every generation for the last hundred years have, have said they are a terminal generation. Now, you might say, I've never said that. But actually, it is. It's been known. It, it, the study, those that study this stuff say that every generation in the last hundred years have felt that they were a terminal generation. What that means is, is that in their thinking, they believed that it was this generation within the body of Christ that would see the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, they were thinking, oh, we haven't got long to go. This is it. The last hundred years. I want to say to you that before the last hundred years, if we had saints before the last hundred years come and join us in our period of time, they would wonder what we're on. Because they never had that. They didn't have that. But even though they talked, they lived in the expectation that Jesus could come any day, their theology was a little bit different. Their theology was totally different because, you see, a lot of their expectations, a lot of guys prior to before 100 years, they didn't live very long, eh? I was just reading a story of a, of a, of a saint, of a guy who died in as 30 years of age and what he'd done in just a number of years. And he knew, he, he spoke in his diaries. He, he said, I, I don't believe I will live here long, you know? And, but in the last 100 years, we've... Uh, we, we've, we've had generations rising up and, and it's coming out all the time, you know. We used to be in the last days, but if you listen to some parts of the body of the Christ, we're not in the last days, we're in the last of the last days. Now, I have a problem about this message. My issue is this, what if it's not? What if it's not? Because I think that what we're actually doing, what i actually seen happen in the last hundred years is, do you know that before the last hundred years, that the, that the group of people who made the most significant changes to universities, businesses, ruling of nations, the arts, medicine, science, were who? Christians. Were Christians. But in the last hundred years, there has been this movement that says what? That's the world. We don't engage with it. But it's actually deeper than that because there's been an understanding. And I'm at the rapture bus stop waiting to go. And that has been the underlining demise of our theology in the last hundred years. And so what we have done is where we would have a William and Catherine Booth that would say, the world for God, we've now got a salvation army that will say, I need to get you saved so that you will be ready for heaven. The question, dominating question in the last hundred years has been this, where will you go if you die tonight? One of the major comments one of the major statements that were made prior to that, the last hundred years was this. How can we take a dark world and change it? Right? Now what this has done, imagine, imagine if you're a child in today's society. Who are the people of light? Must be the church. <coughs> Mustn't it? 
So, so I believe that. I believe even if we don't want it, that's who we are. And so you think of a child looking at the church today, thinking about the life that they are going to live. I tell you, I think that we would plant a seed of hopelessness about any future here on earth. And so stop blaming the world. Start looking at our message. I think it's time for us to think about becoming not a terminal generation, but a bridge generation. What that means is this. I will look back into my past and I will honour the past and I will honour it. And I will drag as much that God has done in the past into the now and pass it on to another generation. All right? Some people have thought in the last 100 years in particular, or maybe the last 50 years in particular, that the most important issue for the church is its music. There have been more divisions over culture of styles of music. But one of the things that was actually said uh, during, the, just in this last week, I sat down with guys who know a lot more about this subject, about you know the, the culture to which we're living. They said, watch it, watch it. You will notice that as we begin in the Western world to pull society apart and give a sense of hopelessness, um, that many of the old hymns will come back. Because many of the old hymns were written with the sense of hope. Now, I don't know. Well, that person said that because he's not in current church leadership, I thought. Oh, it's already begun. It's already begun. You know, I have travelled a lot over the last 30 years with music style, for instance. And I, and I am sitting, the, this week I sat at a conference and, and the song that moved people to tears was It Is Well In My Soul, written years ago. You, you with me? Now, why do I say, why, why is this subject important for me? Because if you live for now, you've missed it. If you live for now, you, if you think, man, it's just all about now, you've missed it. If you don't have some sense of looking over your shoulder, honouring the past, honouring that which has been given to you, because I believe that that's what God does. God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He is the God of generations, and he's been involved in generations. And I believe it's a really important, I believe it's a really important word for us today, we need to become a bridge generation. Um, I know for myself, I speak my own testimony, that the, the most difficult time in my officership is when I receive farewell orders. Reason being that from the moment it's announced to me that I am out of here, I struggle to keep focused on where I am at the moment. Right? What if we had told a church... What if we had told generations, you're out of here? Maybe we wouldn't have been conscious enough about the now and what we could do to change our world now. I don't know. Something to think about, eh? Here's the scripture. God says uh, in Psalm 71, he says, I will come and proclaim your mighty acts, sovereign Lord. I will proclaim your righteous deeds, yours alone. Since my youth, God, you have taught me, and to this day I declare your marvellous deeds. Even when I am old and grey, do not forsake me, my God, till I declare your power to the next generation, your mighty acts to all who are to come. You know, I believe that there needs to come a cry in the heart of today's people that says, God, give me revival so that I have a story to pass on to another generation. You know, um, you think about it. There are many people who are going through life today, who are going through life without a, a sense of encounter with God. It has been just barren. All the years they're going to come. They have no story to pass on about what God has done in the past. I don't know about you, but I refuse to do that. I want my grandson to hear the stories from his papa about how God moved. How God moved. I don't want to say to my son, oh, just be faithful, my grandson, just be faithful, just be faithful, just be faithful. No, no, he'll be faithful, but 
giving stories of what God did in my generation. Because we're always one generation away from extinction. Extinction. Extinct. Yeah, you know. All right? You got the word. Have a look at this next strip, scripture. It says this. Psalm 78 verse 3 says, Things we have heard and known, things our ancestors have told us, we will not hide them from this, their descendants. We will tell them uh, to the next generation and praise that praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power and his wonders he has made. He decreed statutes for Jacob and established the law in Israel, which uh, he commanded to our ancestors to teach their children. Okay. Teach this, so the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born. And they in turn would tell their children. Then they would put their trust in God and would not forget his deeds, but would keep his commands. They would not be like ancestors, a stubborn and rebellious generation whose heart were not loyal to God, whose spirits were not faithful to him. You know, a stubborn and rebellious generation is a generation that will not pass on to another generation. That's who God says is stubborn and rebellious. You want to be known as a stubborn and rebellious individual? What he's saying is you've got something from God that you should be passing on to another generation. Um, Proverbs uh, 13, 22 says this, A good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed to belong to us and to our children forever, that we may follow all the words uh, uh, of his law. So what must we pass on? These are the things that I've been thinking we should be passing on. We should be passing on to another generation. Revelations of truth and values. You know, the, the Deuter Deuteronomy tells us that, that if you have had a revelation from God, it is something that not only you should hold on to, but you should pass it on to another generation. And I believe this. I believe that there have been revelations of truths and values that have been lost. They have been lost. You know it's possible. The Word of God will show you very clearly that it is possible that God speaks to one generation. There would come one, for instance. There would come a prophet in, in a day and would say there is coming a Josiah who will do this. And it would be hundreds of years later that this Josiah would arise and say that I follow David, his father. He didn't follow. His father was another dude. When he says, no, I acknowledge, what he was doing was he was saying, hey, I acknowledge that my father, David, righteous, I today pick up. So God can actually cross generations. You know that, don't you? But I don't think he wants to. I really believe that he wants to take one generation to a level of revelation and truth. So God-given dreams and visions. You know this, don't you? You know that uh, David had a vision to build a tabernacle, but he wasn't allowed to do it. His son Solomon got to do it. Another generation. Think about it. Your, your, your mum and dad? Your mum and dad was, uh, um, was godly? Mum and dad? Maybe they've gone now? Did they pass on the God-given dreams and visions? Yes, yeah, some did. You know, there, I carry some stuff that I've heard come not so much from my dad, but more from my family line. Vision. I'm standing up saying, well, I want to take it to another level in this generation, and I'll pass it on to another generation. Wisdom, skills, ability, resources, and wealth, testimonies of God's power. Over the years, I've encouraged young people to go and sit with our older people. But please, if you're older, I'm speaking to me. When, when people come to you, don't talk about the things that we used to do and we don't do now. Because that's major turn off. Talk about what God has done in the past and he can still do. You know? We, we were turning off generations because all we're hearing is moaning and groaning about what we used to do and we don't do it anymore. That's not passing on an inheritance. Passing on an inheritance is that you would sit with a 92-year-old and count something of a journey of a 92-year-old. You, you with me? That's honouring. That's what we've got to be about. I, I'm pretty hot on this one, but... Um, 
You know, a uh, guy by the name of Donovan Bailey, he's in your notes, he won the 1996 100 metre gold medal with a speed of 9.84 seconds. But I want to say to you, his run was not the fastest 100 metres that was run at those Olympics. Why? Because everyone who ran and got the gold medal in the 4 by 100 relay, those that ran second, third and fourth, all ran a faster time than Donovan ba Bailey when he ran his 100 metres. Do you know why? Donovan Bailey started from stationary position. The runners who ran and got the gold medal at number two and number three and number four in the relay all started from a running position. I do not want to drop the baton so that my next generation has to start from a stationary position. Why can I not live a life in such a way that as I am running, I am calling my kids to come run with me so that as they run with me one day, it'll be time for me to cease this earthly journey and I want them to be carrying on from there, not saying, hey, there's the bat and go and find it for yourself. I hear parents saying this. I want my kids to find themselves. No, I don't. I don't want my kids. I want my kids to find what I found. Because you see, you're actually saying to kids, go out there, make all the same mistakes. No, 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 no. I don't want to do that. I, I don't need... The children following me don't have to make the same mistakes I made. If I've taught them with a, with a heart to listen, they'll hear it. They may have to go out and experience stuff for themselves. I'm not denying that. But listen, I'm not going to lead them such in a way that they go and find their own way. I want them to come and run with me. And because one day, you know what happens in a, in a, in a um, relay uh, race? You need to know this. This is very important. I've never, I'm not an athlete but in that sense. But what happens is, is this. You started off, right? You start off. You're a leg one. And you pass the baton on to number, number two. Number two starts. Do you know what number one does? Number one just picks up his gear and wanders off and says, well, I've done my bit. Does he? No. He keeps watching. Hebrews says that we are surrounded by a crowd of witnesses. You've wondered about that verse? That's what it means. These are people who have run in your lane, passed on what you're carrying, and are watching what you're doing with it. It's good stuff. You think, no, no, I have to start this journey by myself. No, no, no. God's had you on his mind before you were even born. There was someone in your past that began to run the lane. And you say, oh, but man, I've got so much pain in my life. I've got so much trouble and so much, you know, no, no. Well, well, it's okay. It's okay. You might go off to the left and you might have people shouting from heaven, go right! But we don't hear that stuff because somehow we've got to get back on there. But I want you to know, I really believe this. I believe this. That they have not finished their race yet until the end of time when we all finish it together. Mm, they're watching. They're cheering. They're cheering. They'll say, come on. Go further. Go f you, you know what happens? You pass it on, and then you'll race the same. You don't, you don't, you know, if you're a real good encourager, what do you do? You say, go faster than me. You don't, you don't say to the next person, hey, here it is, and I want you to run slower than me. <laughs> you don't do that, do you? No. You, you, you get past it, you say, yeah, you run faster than what I ever run. Generational transfer. I love it. It's a subject. I better get back to my notes. I'm about to waffle. Here we go. So then, so then, let's have a look at Second Kings. Push it the wrong way. Upside down. Sorry, folks. <laughs> Second Kings. When, when they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, tell me, what can I do for you before I'm taken from you? 
Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elisha replied. You've asked a a difficult thing, Elijah said. Yet if you see me when I am taken from you, it will be yours. Otherwise, otherwise it will not. Here's the story. Elisha is walking with Elijah and he knows, they both know, you know, there are prophets who come to Elisha and says, don't trouble, don't trouble your master. He's, you know, he's about to be taken. Everybody knows, Elisha knows, but he will not let go of his father, his spiritual father. He will not let him go. And then when it gets to the point where Elijah says to him, what is it that you want? What do you want? And he says, he says, I want a double portion. Now, now, you know, I've heard preachers preach on this, and I think every, every, every way they preach it's okay for me. But, but actually what Elisha, Elisha was asking was this. He must acknowledge the son of his unloved wife as the firstborn by giving him a double share of all he has. That son is the first sign of his father's strength. The right of the firstborn belongs to him. What Elisha was saying was, hey, this, the point is, Elijah, El, other way around, Elisha was not the natural son of Elijah. But what Elisha was asking here was that, which is, if you see, is the natural son's right to ask. So he was asking in the spiritual, I want a double portion of what you gave. That's what I want. And I will not let you go until you give it to me. Now, Elijah says, you asked a difficult thing. Right? And I think, I think if you go to anybody saying, what do you want? You said, I want just a double portion. Well, I want you to understand this. That really, you're not asking them for what, you're asking the God. You're saying, God, I see something in the, my spiritual dad, that I want more of. I want more. I want more of that. And that's generational transfer. Generational transfer. It is looking at people and saying, whatever they carry, God, I want that. I need that. I want. I've done this. I want that, God. I want more. Why? Because I want another generation to not be running around trying to find the baton. I want the next generation to be running, going for it, and making a difference by bringing the kingdom of God into our world, not sitting around waiting. What are you doing here? Well, you know, don't, don't bother because Jesus is coming. You know, 30 years ago, we were actually telling people in the church, you don't, you don't need insurance anymore. Why have insurance? Christians, why do you need insurance? Because Jesus is coming again. Well, that would have done you a lot of good in Christchurch. Uh, you, you know what I mean? We, we, we've got to live here, man. We've got, to, we've got to live in a way that we're here forever and I'm going to pass on to another generation. One day he's going to call me home and then I'm going to stand in the grandstand and I'm going to be cheering on the next generation. So run this race. So may the Lord bless you. And if you're saying, oh, well, that, that's never happened to me, my final comment is, why don't you start? Why don't you start living this way? God bless you. Thank you. Awesome. Big morning. Lunch. Now this is